The following KQED production was produced in high definition. One fateful day in 2004, Berkeley engineering physicist Ashok Gadgil's phone rang. It was the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, part of the U.S. Agency for International Development. The officer was asking for help in Africa. And he said, literally, that the Darfur refugee women are being raped in droves as they must leave the safety of the camps to gather fieldwood. Can you do something about it? Darfur is a region in western Sudan, the largest country in Africa. Since 2003, it has been the location of an ongoing genocide. Since the Darfur crisis started uh, back in 2003, I was aware of what was going on and, and felt terrible about it. But like, like most of us, I didn't think I could have anything I could do to help. It was one of those tragedies that unfolds like what's happening in Kenya or what's, what happened in Rwanda earlier. In 2003, following a series of tribal and political uprisings, the Sudanese government sanctioned violent militias called the Janjaweed to destroy entire villages in Darfur. Since then, a brutal campaign has targeted civilians, killing more than 400,000 people and displacing 2.5 million others into refugee camps and fundamentally altering their way of life. Traditionally, throughout Africa, women gather and sell wood to be used for cooking fires. But because of the density of refugees, fuel wood has become scarce. Women are forced to travel far outside the camps, often walking for up to seven hours to find wood. Any encounter with the Janjaweed militiamen while searching for firewood almost certainly would result in rape. And they have to go because there are a few men in the camps. About 20% of the camp residents are men. But if the men get caught outside, they are killed. It's a horrible choice. So what could a physicist in Berkeley, California, possibly do to help Darfuri refugees? Well, when Gadgill learned that the women cook by placing a round pot on a three-stone fire, he knew that it was possible to engineer some relief. Three stone fire is the least efficient way to take energy from the fuel wood and turn it into heat into the pot. Typical three stone fire uh, efficiency is five to six percent. The reason three stone fire is inefficient is because there is poor combustion, which means you don't get much chemical energy doesn't go into heat, and there is poor heat transfer. That means that heat doesn't go into the pot. So I, I figured one should be able to design a stove that should be cheap, should work with their parts, with their fuel, with their cooking style, and uh, something that should be at least 25-30% efficient. That's a fourfold in gain in their efficiency. Uh, and that, that means instead of going out every other day, they would go out once a week. In 2005, Gadgill led a fact-finding team into the heart of the conflict. What they learned there from talking with Sudanese women and their families laid the foundation for designing a better cook stove. Five things go in to determine efficiency of a stove in the real world. It's not just the stove by itself. Get the, the, the cook to tend the fire right. Make sure that you understand what kind of cooking is going on in what kind of pot. Make sure the pot fits well over the stove and oxygen supply is controlled but adequate. And make sure all of that works with the right kind of fuel that's available locally. In order to design a good stove, all these variables had to be taken into account as designs were tested. After months, they finally had a functioning prototype. But a prototype isn't a product until it can be manufactured in a realistic way. Enter Ken Chow. When I heard about um, Dr. Asher Gadgil and the Darfur Stoves Project, it seemed like a really good match because um, in, in addition to being a volunteer with Engineers Without Borders, I'm also a mechanical engineer here at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab where this project is, is, is based. It would be Chow's job to determine how the stove could be mass-produced in Darfur. 
Depending on the availability of materials and tools, they'd either be manufactured from scratch or assembled from pre-cut metal patterns called flat packs. But both methods would require a nuanced understanding of resources in Darfur. Our primary considerations when we do the design for manufacture is basically how many parts are there and reducing and reducing the number of parts. How are the parts connected? Uh, the, how the parts are connected has a big impact on how easy it is to, to build. Are they connected through screws or rivets or do you need electricity to do spot welding? For the team, finding a way to manufacture the simple sheet metal stoves locally, thereby helping to build the internal economy of the refugee camps, is more important than the bottom line. We do want to foster innovation in Darfur, and we want to give the opportunity for income generation um, so that by, by having assembly sites or manufacturing sites in Darfur, we would hire the people in Darfur in, including people f from inside the camps to, to work and build the stoves um, that would go back into their own economy. After eight different prototypes, the team was pleased to find that the stove, with its smooth airflow and snug upper rim, cooked food four times more efficiently than a three-stone fire. In other words, it requires 75% less wood to cook the same amount of food. The Berkeley Darfur stove is designed to aid in both complete combustion, so you don't get charcoal, you don't get much smoke. Most of the chemical energy in the wood goes into heat. And then the stove is designed to work well with the parts traditionally used by the Darfur refugees, so that most of the heat actually ends up in the part. This pile of wood represents the amount of wood needed to cook a full meal for a family of seven using a three stone fire. This pile of wood represents the amount of fuel wood needed to cook the same meal for the same size family in the same pot but with a Berkeley Darfur stove. Think of each piece of wood here representing the risk of exposure to rape and violence and the hardship of carrying the wood around on their head for seven hours as they go back and forth in the hot desert. This is the reduction in all that hardship and all the risk with the Berkeley Darfur stove. Surprisingly, once the stoves are built, they are not going to be given away free of charge. It will cost a family $20 for a stove that will last about five years. Selling the stove at least for a nominal price, ensures two ground truths. One is that the stove is worth at least something to the, to the residents. And secondly, uh, ensures that a stove doesn't get sold as scrap metal. Uh, so the stove price should be at least higher than that of scrap metal. And of course, to the camp residents who are totally destitute, who have nothing at all, uh, we should give the stoves away free. So when it's all said and done, what kind of impact will this stove really have? Well, it obviously decreases the women's exposure to violence, but it also dramatically reduces the expense and labor of fuel wood gathering. And for the families who've resorted to selling food rations in order to buy wood, having a more efficient stove frees up cash for other necessities. Uh, $250 per year is what each stove would save, and it will last for five years, so that is $1,250 in the pockets of the women refugees. So if we set up a factory that makes 100 stoves a day and runs 250 days a year, we have 25,000 stoves being built in this factory. Uh, and each stove is worth $1,200 to the refugees. So you run the numbers and you see that one year's production of a factory like this is worth $30 million in the pockets of the refugees. This project gives me one more reaffirmation that use of modern science and engineering technology can go very far in solving desperate problems of people who are at the very bottom of the economic pyramid.
quest free. Discover more and donate at kqed.org slash quest.